All right, there we go. Boom, HCC. How are you doing today? It's great to be with you. So glad to be here. So glad to get to enjoy this Memorial Day weekend together. I want to say welcome to you here in the house in Victorville. Those of you who are joining us in Apple Valley, those in Hesperia, and a special thanks to you out in Phelan. Joanne and I got to go out there last week and just spend some time with you guys on a Sunday. Absolutely loved it. So thanks for having us uh, for a great day. Well, here we are in this weekend, this Memorial Day weekend, and I don't know for you, I can, it can be easy for me to miss the meaning of why we even do things like that. Why do we have a holiday? Why do we have the day off on Monday? And I have a feeling that this year, this concept of memorial is a little bit more aware, a little bit more dialed in for us than other times. Obviously, we think of this weekend and we commemorate. That word memorial is a lot like what we do when we gather together to have a memorial service. We recognize and we validate and we give thanks for those, in this case, who gave their lives for our good as a country. But yet this weekend, our hearts are also in a whole different place thinking of a memorial and the memorial services That'll be happening this weekend and into next week for the victims of those in this school shooting in Texas at Robb Elementary. And I know that just in all kinds of ways, appropriately so, it just kind of rips us open on the inside. God, what is going on? And where did evil like that come from? Those are the things, no doubt, you've been thinking about this week. And I think that one of the things I'm most excited about with being here with you in person, I think you've made the right decision. Because I feel like sometimes when there have been things that have been gut-wrenching in my life, there's the tendency, the temptation to run from God and his people, not towards. I'm so grateful you're here today. I'm grateful and there's something about coming together as the people of God to sing his praise to a God who is faithful to a God who is the same God. Even though our circumstances are so difficult and we, our hearts break for those who are going through unspeakable things today. And there's something about being together in this place that matters. So I just wanna thank you for making that decision. I wanna thank you for being here today. I wanna thank you for the way you've sung and I wanna thank you for the way that you're gonna tune in to God's word. And, and you're gonna see some interesting parallels today. We have noticed in the book of Esther incredible wickedness, a wickedness that desires out of frustration for one individual, a desire to wipe out an entire race, an entire ethnic group, because one guy won't bow to you. And we talked about the backstory of that, but nonetheless, that's all driven by hatred. It is all ultimately driven by Satan himself. And here we are 2,500 years later, And we're thinking about and considering and trying to process wickedness today as well because we keep seeing it in our world. I will tell you in one way, not meant to be trite, but definitely true, Jesus is the answer. There is no doubt we live in a broken world. We need him now and every day. So I'm grateful you're here. We're gonna dive in today. If you have a Bible, we're gonna be in Esther chapter five if you wanna make your way there. Was so grateful for Pastor Tom being back in the house last week. He did such a great job. And and what chapter four was doing was kind of bringing this action to a climax. Kind of bringing the, the drama, bringing the intensity of what is going to happen. Will Esther step up? And in chapter four, Tom walked us through that great part, uh, Mordecai reaching out to his cousin, to his niece and saying, hey, God has uniquely placed you. Remember, he doesn't say the word God, but we know that's what's going on in this book. God's providential way of, of setting up circumstances and all leading to a place though where Esther has a choice to make. And Mordecai gives this great line, who knows that for such A time as this, that God has orchestrated events for you to be a person of influence. 
Note, by the way, Mordecai's powerful sense of still reckoning, even though it doesn't say the word God, that ultimately these people were going to be rescued, even if it wasn't from Esther, but she had a choice to make. Are you going, Esther, to step up? And that's really been the purpose of this whole series. Why are we looking at the book of Esther today? Is to keep looking at the ways in our lives. Areas that are filled with wickedness. Areas that are filled with a a sense of just continued disconnection. Of neglect. God, where are you asking me to step up? Where are you asking me to step up in what I say and what I do? And we're finding that courage that Esther musters up, and that's where we left her off last week. We left her off in her response back to Mordecai, saying, call all the Jews in Susa, in this capital city, to fast for three days. Don't eat, drink anything. I'm gonna do the same with my attendants, and at the end of that time, I'm gonna go approach the king, even if it's the last thing I do. So we see her having resolve and saying, I'm going to step up. And that's where we pick up the action today. If you have a Bible, Esther chapter 5, verse 1. On the third day after this fast, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall, facing the entrance. So she's going to come into the line of sight of the king. And all of this doesn't mean a whole lot to us, but watch the next line. When he saw Esther standing in the court, if you were with us last week, this is where you should be holding your breath, because this is do or die right here based on this. He was pleased, pleased with her, and he held out the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Then the king asked, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be given to you. If it pleases the king, replied Esther, let the king, together with Haman, come today to a banquet I've prepared for, for him. Bring Haman at once, the king said, so that we may do what Esther asks. So the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther had prepared. As they were drinking wine, the king again asked Esther, now what is your petition? It's kind of like there's probably more to this. It will be given to you. And what is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Esther replied, my petition and my request is this. If the king regards me with favor and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come tomorrow to the banquet I will prepare for them. Then... I will answer the king's question. If you were with us last week, you know that that part, that building of the tension was appropriate. Because in Esther chapter four, when Mordecai says, hey, you gotta go to the king, you gotta do something so that this group of people doesn't get wiped off the face of the planet. Esther, so that your group of people doesn't get wiped off the face of the planet. And she says to him, hey, but Mordecai, let me remind you, it's been 30 days since the king has had me in his presence and you can't just go waltzing up. This is what Pastor Tom read last week, Esther 4.11. All the king's officials, this is Esther speaking, and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned by the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. So with great reason, Esther has a lot of anxiety, a lot of of fear about if I just kind of march on in there, man, it could be my last decision. So after three days of fasting and calling out, I'm sure that's what she's doing, calling out to the Lord. You know, even if we are not in a place of consistently following God, when our back is against the wall, man, we're looking up. Crying out to God, God, give me favor with this king because I'm going to do it. I'm going to step up. One of the books I've told you that was really key for me in this, even why the book of Esther and why now was Max Lucado's You Were Made for This Moment. Here's a quote from it in this context. Esther came before the king in beauty only after she lingered before the king of kings in humility. Once we have spoken to the king of heaven, we are ready to face any king on earth. That's a great line. 
And so Esther said, hey, it's all, all the cards are on the table. I'm gonna step forward. King responds with favor. But it's the next part of the narrative that we read that's very confusing. King, I'm, I'm summoning up all this courage, all this strength to stand before you. You wanna go to lunch? <laughs> it seems so weird. Wanna go to lunch? Oh yeah, and bring your buddy Haman. Oh, okay. And when we read it, we might read into that and go, oh man, she just chickened out. She, she flaked in this moment of great need. She just kind of backed away and said, oh, I just, lunch will be good. Or what I tend to believe, something actually very different, she is very crafty and cunning and very clever. Because what she's doing is she is preparing an opportunity She's creating the very best scenario that she can to ask the king for mercy for her own life as well as to indict evil Haman in what he's done. And that's not the question you just walk up before the king and go, yo king, got this problem, could you do something about it? She's building mystery, she's building a sense of drama, she's building intrigue. To put it in a way, she's being incredibly strategic. That's what I think is going on in this scene. Incredible cunning to be able to create the scenario so she can make this request. Simple question, can you remember a time where you had to be especially strategic? Where you had to be tactical in the way that you made decisions? Maybe for some of you, it's actually your vocation, your job. You get paid to be strategic in what you do. And no, I never said the word lawyer in that last sentence. <laughs> though I might have been thinking it, all right? But, but here's my point, is that there are times in our lives when we go, man, I've really got to be careful about how I do this and not just right through the front door. It's funny that of all the times when I was thinking back to when I've really tried to be intentionally strategic, it's bizarre that the example that kept bubbling to the top was me on a race course. Because if you know me, that is not where you'd usually find Todd. But this is how it went down. Probably about 10 years ago, we were at an HDC staff retreat and we happy to be down in Orange County and we're at one of the K1 go-kart tracks. That helped you a little bit right there, okay. Okay, not a racetrack, a go-kart track. That helps, Todd. That sounds more like you. Anyways, we're in this thing, and, and what had happened, we, if you know our staff team, we love each other, we love to have fun, and to kind of be fair, a few of us love to cheat. So it, that was the scenario, the idea was, let's do a few heats of these races, and we'll ultimately get the final heat, right? Like a good weekend of racing does, you get to that final heat. Well, in my first heat, to try to qualify, I remember being in the top probably three or four, and that pushed me into the finals. So here I am, I remember it being about 12 cars deep, and I remember being towards the back, so I wasn't even like a, a qualifier with a high time, I just kind of made it. And I remember as soon as the flag gets going and the cars start out, there's this one car that just kind of gets ahead of everything because right at the beginning, there's this huge pile of go-karts right at the front of the race. They all just kind of somehow figured out how to get up on each other's bumpers, and they're all just stuck. And so I'm in the back and I kind of figure out how to navigate it. Me, Pastor George in front of me, me and a couple people probably behind. But we're talking like the carnage of seven go-karts that are just stuck and they're not going anywhere. Pastor Jeff Barber's way out in the front. Nobody's gonna catch him the whole race. He's literally a half lap in front of everybody. But I'm right behind Pastor George. Now my brain is going, this guy loves NASCAR. He knows auto racing, like a little tamer version of what we're doing, but he knows this stuff. I'm just gonna stick behind him and I'm gonna, I'm gonna look for an opening. Our go-karts go the same. They're, they're, they're the same speed. So I'm not gonna take him by being faster. I'm just gonna have to look for that opening. So the carnage of lap one, we kind of get ourselves around and now the other cars start spreading out, but no one's gonna catch Jeff Barber, George, and then me and a few cars behind. And we're, I'm just kind of tailing him all the way around this course. And there's always this hairpin turn just before you hit the straightaway that each time I'm going, oh, I'm just holding on for dear life. And we do that for lap two and lap three, 
lap four. By the time we hit lap five, I'm just going, this ain't gonna happen. George is not gonna make a mistake and I'm just gonna have to sit here and draft off him until I get third place at the end of the thing. Lap six, lap seven, we come around to lap eight and at that hairpin turn, George took it a little wide and Todd shot in. And George followed me the rest of that race. You have never seen someone so excited to get second place in all their lives. And I remember driving across the checker flag going, yeah, be the NASCAR guy. This is so great. And you're wondering, Todd, what does this have to do with Esther? Very little, very little. But I wanted you to know I, meet Pete, I beat Pastor George one time and it was so great, so great. Esther isn't being so strategic or tactical in what she's saying yet, but she's being incredibly strategic in how. She's being very thoughtful about when she's going to lay this out and not just drop it in his lap, but build the suspense. It's interesting that Jesus said that we could learn something from Esther in this regard. Jesus was preparing his disciples and he told them, I'm gonna leave. And that in of itself caused him to go, what? Where? We're following you, dude. And like, what, what do you mean you're going? But he's forecasting he's going to leave. And in that forecast, he tells them, you're gonna be in some scenarios and some situations that are gonna be incredibly challenging and very difficult. But I want you to know that my spirit's gonna be with you. You're gonna be okay. And it's in that context that he says this in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Jesus speaking, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Just do that math. Wolves win most every time. I'm sending you like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. I think this might be the only place in all of scripture that we're ever compared positively to a snake. Snakes are always that sense. Even Satan himself takes this shape of a snake-like creature in Genesis 3, always has this downside of what a serpent or a snake is about. This is one of the few positive moments. And Jesus says, he doesn't say, just go be immoral if the moment needs it. Hmm. He said, be as innocent as doves. But in that innocence, be shrewd, be thoughtful, size up the situation, be savvy as to what you see, and be incredibly strategic in how you walk forward. Huh. Jesus himself is actually incredibly strategic. All throughout John's gospel, Jesus keeps saying, it's not yet my time. Timing is gonna be so key. It begins in chapter two when his mother says, hey, help these people out at this wedding. And Jesus says, you know, it's not time yet. I'm not stepping into that arena at this point. And he's gonna say that all through God, John's gospel until John 12. My hour has now come. So Jesus is incredibly strategic as to the when and how he's going to present himself as a sacrifice for our sins. So in your notes, let's track on this idea. Oh, I forgot something. I wanted to tell you this too. The reason why it's so absolutely critical that we are tactical, that we are strategic, is because we have an enemy who is. We call it spiritual warfare for a reason. Not just spiritual life, not just spiritual rhythms, those are things, but spiritual warfare because we're against an enemy who is scheming for our worst. So what does Paul say say when he's writing to the church at Ephesus? Not that it's even so much about how we scheme, it's that we armor up. Ephesians 6.1, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand, what? Against the devil's schemes. He is tactical. We're called to live a life armored up with the truth and the resources of God and in that, to be strategic in return. Look in your notes. It's not just what we do when it's time to step up, but it's what we do while we're preparing to step up. It's not just what we do when it's time to step up, it's what we do while we're preparing to step up. 
At HGC, what are we all about? We're all about preparing every generation to change their worlds for Christ. We're all about helping you do what God has called you, specifically as an individual, as a married couple, as a family, to have that kind of Jesus influence in your relational world. What is our part in that is the preparation. And as you're processing, God, give me a mind that is thoughtful. Give me a wise, discerning mind. Give me good strategy with the people in my world. That's what drives you to pray for them. That's the why. God, I'm praying, would you do something in their lives that helps them understand how much you love them? Would you do something in their lives in the midst of difficult circumstances when they're walking away from you, bring them to the end of themselves? That's why we pray that way. You think of the different events that are going on at HDC and, and it's how you invite people to what type of event. You're being strategic. I think that would be a great fit for them. They would never come to church, but they would go to that. These are things that we're called to do, not just simply keep throwing four spiritual laws in people's face, but to be shrewd, to be strategic for the people that God has strategically placed in your world. It's not just what you do when you step up, it's what you're preparing to do before you step up that matters as well. Let's continue on, we're at chapter five, verse nine. Haman went out that day and in high spirits, he's just been invited to this great lunch put on by the queen. But when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that he neither rose nor showed fear in his presence, watch, he was filled with rage against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. Calling together his friends and Zeresh, his wife, Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth, his many sons, and all the ways the king had honored him, and how he had elevated him above all the other nobles and officials. And that's not all, Haman added. I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave, and she has invited me along with the king tomorrow. But all this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see that Jew, Mordecai, sitting at the king's gate. I guess for Mordecai, or I'm sorry, for Haman, things can go pretty awesome. You can feel like you're flying on top of the world with all the accolades and the favor, but one little thing, one guy who won't point to you and say, you're awesome, and it ruins everything. It's as though all those good things had never happened because this one guy won't show you fear in his presence. Huh. And we realize there's more to that story because it isn't just one guy, it's this one particular guy. Did you note that as his day comes crashing down, did you note that he restrained himself and what must have been going through his mind Okay, breathe, this guy's not telling me I'm awesome, but I actually wrote into law when he's going to die. So I guess it's all gonna be okay. I can't think of any other reason why he would have showed restraint in that moment. I want you to notice this too. We said in the book of Esther, there's all kinds of irony. Irony is gonna keep building through the rest of the story, but I found it ironic. Remember in chapter three, why does Haman lose his mind about this Jew Mordecai? It's because he won't bow. In chapter five, why does he lose his mind in rage over Mordecai? It's because he won't stand. Have you ever found yourself in a situation that no matter what you do, it's wrong? That's exactly what was going on between Haman and Mordecai. No matter what Mordecai did, stand up, sit down, fight, 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 didn't matter. He was in the wrong because Haman had, well, he had a set of lenses by which he was seeing everything that Mordecai did just inflamed the rage. I think about us. I think about the lives that we live and rather than look out the window, I'd have you rather look in the mirror and ask the question, are there people in your life today 
that when you see them, prior to seeing them, prior to getting that text, you're just kind of going through your day. But the moment you hear them say something, the moment you see them across the room, the moment that text comes in, boom. The lenses go on and you've got this caricature of who they are. You know what they're thinking. You know why they're looking at you that way. You know the tone, the tone in their voice is only X. And by the way, when you put these shades on, it is never because something's awesome. It's always because I am frustrated. I am angry. I am hurt. We talked about a staff retreat we went to 10 years ago as a staff team. We just got back from one last week. And in a short, just devotional setting with our team and our, their spouses, I just got to talk about this a little bit, about believing the best in each other. And thinking about the lenses that we put on when we make decisions. And, and I'm gonna tell you, this is a choice. This is not something that just happens or just needs to keep happening. It's a choice of if you put these on and choose not to believe the best or if you leave them down, giving people the benefit of the doubt. So in your notes, let's think about it this way for our application and our just kind of wondering as we look in the mirror about our own lives. Are the lenses that you're using to see others, are they tinted? And are they tainted by frustration, fear, or failure? Is that the way that you're seeing an individual or group of people in your world? Or are they informed by how Jesus would have us see each other? We looked at a passage in Colossians 3, through the lenses of compassion, gentleness, humility, kindness, patience, and love. And though Haman was a million miles away from being concerned about what God would think of his life, you here who are here today, who are concerned about that, Jesus, I want to please you with everything about me, including my attitudes, including the lenses that I put on when I see people in my world. This stuff matters to God and therefore it needs to matter to us. So what do you do? What do you do when you've been flying high, had your whole day crash because a guy won't tell you that you're awesome? You go find some people who will. At least that's what Haman did. You find your wife and you find a bunch of friends and you bring them all together and you tell them how awesome you are. That's exactly what we just read. Guys, I need you, need you to come close. Let me tell you about all my wealth. Let me tell you about all my stature. Let me tell you how favored I am. Oh, but man, I'm dying because this one guy won't tell me I'm awesome back. That's how the rest of that narrative goes. Now, we got introduced to Haman's wife, Zeresh. Zeresh, I appreciated so much Pastor Tom bringing to light some, some characters last week that aren't the few that we think of probably four or five generally. Zeresh is one of those who's that, one of the lesser characters in the narrative, but man, she matters a ton. Her name is Persian, and it can actually, it's fascinating, it can mean one of two things, and they're very different. It could either mean golden, or it could mean one with disheveled hair. I don't even know what to do with that. You pick, right? It doesn't really tell us. Her just name is Zeresh, and it mean, that word means both things. So this is his wife, and, and what we're going to see is we're going to see, once again, the power of influence between spouses, I'm so grateful for my wife who talks me down off of decisions that I'm all ramped up and amped up about, and she balances me. But we're gonna see in just a minute, Zeresh, she only adds gas to the fire. Chapter five of Esther, verse 14. And his wife Zeresh and all his friends say to, said to him, have a pole set up reaching to a height of 50 cubits, and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai, yeah, that's what you read, impaled on it, shish kebab. Then go with the king to the banquet and enjoy yourself. Let's start out the day that way, have this guy killed, and then just go have a blast. This suggestion delighted Haman, and he had a pole set up. I told you that wickedness and evil from 2,500 years ago doesn't look a whole lot different than what Texas experienced this week. An incredible devaluing of human life, 
an incredible sense of just simply, I'm just gonna go do something and no matter what the consequence is. Man, with a wife and friends like that, you don't need anybody else's help to keep raging. And, and notice again what we've said earlier, this is all driven by racist hatred. That's what's driving Haman in his quest to not just wipe out every Jew, but now he's saying basically their suggestion was, why are you putting up with this guy? Yes, you've written the date of his death on a calendar, but just take care of it now. You've got the power, you've got the authority, just get it done and stop worrying about him and all the other nobles will just think you're awesome. And that feeds into this ego like nothing else. Sociologists talk about a word that's probably been around for a while, it's been more familiar to me in the pandemic, this phrase called an echo chamber. And an echo chamber is when we surround ourselves with like-minded people who just keep saying all the same stuff but nobody gets to have any dissenting view. That's what Haman did. Let me give you the more Webster's dictionary definition of that. Beliefs, it occurs when beliefs are amplified and reinforced by communication and repetition in, in, I'm sorry, inside a closed system insulated from rebuttal. That's an echo chamber. And if you're experiencing that, we might experience that on a national level, you might experience it in your small group. You could experience it in your family. Where we just keep amping each other up about the same frustrations and no one's allowed to give a different point of view. That always walks us down a road that is for sure blind, but often in all kinds of turmoil. But it, this passage tells us something else as well that's profound. It gives us the reminder of the importance of the voices that we invite to influence our lives. Who are the people we spend time with and what's the kind of advice that they give? The book of Proverbs has so much to say on this topic. Check it out. Proverbs 16, 29. I'm just gonna rattle out a few for you. A violent person entices their neighbor and leads them down a path that is not good. That's like full on, follow me towards bad things. Proverbs 14, seven, stay away from a fool for you will not find knowledge on their lips. Proverbs 12, 26, the righteous choose their friends carefully but the way of the wicked leads them astray. Careful selection of influencers. Proverbs 13, 20, walk with the wise and become wise. I just love that, it just rubs off on you. For a companion of fools, suffers harm. Here's another way of saying it, look in your notes. Many of your best decisions and of your worst decisions are made primarily based upon who you're listening to. Many of your best decisions, many of your worst decisions are made primarily based on who you're listening to. So watch this statement, choose God honoring voices to pay attention to. Note that you get to make the choice. Just because you even have influencers around you doesn't mean you have to listen to them. You can choose, you can seek out, I wanna know what God wants for me in this area. Choose who you're going to listen to. Now some of you would say, well Todd, that's great. What is a God honoring voice? I love so much the dynamic of our teaching team that meets on Monday and Jody just brought that up. Hey, let's, what's the application of that? What does a God honoring voice look like? Here's at least three things I would put in that category in your notes. A person who cares more about telling the truth consistent with God's word than what you might wanna hear. Man, that's the people you want near you. Someone who's gonna tell you the truth consistent with the word of God more than what they think you want to hear. That, that's someone who's a genuine friend when you're trying to make some hard decisions. Secondly, someone who knows the context of the issues that you're dealing with. You've got to be able to divulge the whole story, not just the parts you like, or not just the parts that make you look good. Here's the whole story, and, and in knowing the context, you'll be able to give me better advice. And finally, third, a trusted voice who has discernment to help you take the best path forward. Someone who like walk with the wise would become wise. Someone who just has discernment and you know they do because of the way they live. You watch them make good decisions and you go, you know what, I, I, I need some input from them. 
Some of you would say, Todd, thank you. That's helpful. I don't have those voices in my life. I don't have people that I can trust, that I can talk to about these kinds of things and get good, wise counsel. I don't have God-honoring voices like you've described. I'm not gonna tell you today that you're wrong. I don't know your context. I don't know your situation, but I can tell you this. A couple weeks ago in chapter three, when we talked about really wrestling through some really challenging theological things about the character and the ways of God, I made this open blanket invitation that number one, this is a place you can ask hard questions. HGC is not a closed environment. We're not an echo chamber that says, don't ask hard things here. Just the opposite. You're welcome. But I'm going to make a blanket invitation the same way. If you're going through something deeply challenging and you don't feel like you have God-honoring voices in your life, as we've just described them, we have an amazing ministry staff who loves to help. We have amazing ministry staff who loves you. And they love to help when you're wrestling through a difficult situation. Call us, make an appointment, do something. How do I know what to do? Send an email, but let us be able to help you. And I'm making that invitation because I know that's their heartbeat. They want to help you as you wrestle through challenging things. So this is where we leave. That's the end of chapter five. We leave a a very undone narrative, like what is going on? We leave Esther, whose name the book comes after, in this situation, she's gonna throw another banquet and and what she's going to do when she shares with the king, with King Xerxes, and when she indicts Haman, man, that could all blow up in her face, so we don't know where that's gonna go. And then you got Mordecai, unbeknownst to him, he's been plotted against that night, he's gonna die in the morning. That's where we leave Chapter five, bit of a cliffhanger. I grew up, I like to tell people I grew up in the 80s because that just sounds a little more close to time and had great music in the 80s. But I was a kid, I was in the 70s and there was this great live action Batman show that was taped in the 60s. I didn't see it in real time, but it was great uh, reruns in the 70s when I was a kid. So I come home from school and couldn't wait to turn on live action Batman. In those days, by the way, Batman is all it was, but that's what it was. Um, And in it, what was interesting is the way that the series was done, most episodes were really two-parters. You had to build the climax in part A, and then part B came later on, and you never knew. But there was always this great voice at the end of of episode one of two that just kind of reminded you of the cliffhangerness. I just want to try it. It just seems so appropriate today. (laughs) Will Esther bring her request to the king before it's too late? Will Mordecai be saved from a fate that few of us can imagine? Tune in next time and we'll find out. By the way, you're very kind. That could have gone horribly bad. So let me pray. Father God, we come before you today. Levity can be good in the midst of great tension. And we find ourselves in the story in the story of Esther, we find two characters that, who represent really a whole nation and the odds are stacked against them. God, no doubt there are some here today in this service in all of our campuses who feel as though every odd is against them, who feel as though there's no redemption, there is no way out. Father, we can just imagine that's what Esther and Mordecai felt like. And so what we wanna do, we just wanna pause today and we wanna say thank you. The reason that we need faith is because we don't have sight. And so for those of us, God, struggling to have faith today in the middle of what you're doing, we can't see God, Esther and Mordecai would have loved for you to miraculously come in and just fix everything. But what did you do? You were working providentially behind the scenes. Just like you are in our lives. You are the same God. So we place our concerns, our worries, our anxieties in front of you. 
we think about the people in our own country in the state of Texas who are mourning this week. And we say to all of that, Father, we recognize that you have never gotten off the throne. You're in as much control as you were before this week. And we wanna entrust ourselves to you. If you're here today and you would say, Todd, it is a messed up world. You wouldn't have a lot of people disagreeing with you. But if you've never responded to the invitation in the gospel, the Bible says that you are still in and of the world. You're aligned with it. And the judgment one day that this world system is going to incur is yours. Unless you respond to what's already been done for you. That is the very best news you're ever gonna hear. Because Jesus came and lived a sinless life. Jesus died a sacrificial death on the cross and Jesus was raised supernaturally on the third day. He did those things for you. Not for other people, not for just the whole world and everyone, but he did it for you. He saw you from afar and he went to the cross on your behalf. So today, would you A, admit, admit that you're a sinner who needs a savior. Would you B, believe? Believe that Jesus is the only savior available. And would you C, choose? Choose to put your faith and your confidence in what he's done, not in what you're supposed to do. It's, it's not about a religion. It's all about being redeemed. And you can cry out to God today and ask him, Father, I need you. I need your forgiveness. I want to live my life following after your son. And I pray today, if you make that decision, would you let someone know? Would you communicate that to someone who's been praying for you? Communicate to that, someone, that to someone that you know would be encouraged by that? Because man, that's something we all need is encouragement. It'll go a long way. Father, this week, would you help us in the opportunities you present before us, help us choose to step up by what we do, what we say. Help us to live as your people, ready to do your will. We love you and we pray in the great name of Jesus, amen.